How would you like to improve your health and keep your family safe? You're listening to the Healthy Home Hacks Podcast, where we firmly believe enjoying optimal health shouldn't be a luxury. Healthy Home Authorities and husband and wife team, Ron and Lisa, will help you create a home environment that will level up your health. It's time to hear from the experts. Listen in on honest conversations and gain the best tips and advice. If you're ready to dive in and improve your well being and increase your energy, you're in the right place. All right, here are your hosts bow biologists, authors, media darlings, vicarious vegans, and avocado aficionados, Ron and Lisa Barris. The doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest his patients in the care of human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. Thomas Edison. I couldn't think of a more fitting quote to open today's show. This episode is for anyone listening who has been failed by the Western approach to medicine, a system that only addresses the symptoms of disease and its late stage complications without addressing the disease's underlying causes. Did you know that conventional labs miss 50% of Lyme cases? If you've been diagnosed with environmentally acquired illness or Lyme disease, or suspect that you have either, you don't want to miss this show. We're going to cover the eight signs that your aches and pains may be due to Lyme disease and other tick-borne infection. So stay tuned as we discuss an integrative approach to care, including something called Chinese medical energetics. Our guest today, Dr. Emily Rowe, is the co-founder of the Miami Beach Comprehensive Wellness Center. Emily T. Rowe graduated from the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine in 2004 with a doctorate degree. And after a brief time in the field of internal medicine, she became frustrated with the Western approach to illness. She realized that she was being trained to treat the symptoms of disease and its end stage complications while failing to address its root cause inspired to find a comprehensive and definitive way to heal her patients, she went back to school and completed her master's degree in Chinese herbal medicine and acupuncture with a master's of oriental medicine in 2009. She specializes in the treatment of complex chronic medical illnesses, including autoimmune disease, chronic pain, Lyme, mold, and environmental toxins using a comprehensive range of therapies, including ozone therapy, functional medicine assessments, platelet-rich plasma, and stem cell therapies. Dr. Rowe also holds certifications in yoga, hypnotherapy, and shamanism, which she also uses to treat her patients seeking an alternative to the inadequacies of routine medical care. Welcome to the show, Emily. Yes. Oh, it's such an honor to be with you guys. And I can tell you guys are a lot of fun and very cutting edge. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) We had a little conversation at the beginning before we started. And yeah, she's listened to some of our, what should we say, controversial episodes (laughs) that our listeners are familiar with. Those were my favorite ones. Those were the ones I zeroed in on. (laughs) The taboo topics. But welcome, Emily. We are so thrilled to have you with us today. Just in reading your bio, and that was only a smidgen of it, you are obviously well-versed and well-educated, and I love how your career had pivoted based on not just saying, this is what I'm going to set out to do, even if I don't feel like it's going in the right direction, that you said, hey, no, things aren't really going like this isn't what I expected. I'm going to go these different routes. And so anyways, we're really thrilled to have you with us today. And I want to just dive right in because you suffered chronic Lyme disease. I've known a lot of people who have, I mean, I don't know how common it is, but I'd love to hear your story of what happened in the journey. So I don't know when I acquired Lyme, but I suspect it was as a very small child. I grew up in Florida, but then we moved to Pennsylvania and my mother loved hiking in the woods. It was like her way to get in touch with nature and have her spiritual side. And she would take us on weekends hiking in the woods. I never recall having a tick bite. Have you ever seen a tick on your body before or on someone else's? On other people's? Yes. And I, and I had dogs and I picked a lot of ticks off my dogs. Right. With 
the lighter, right? That's how you get them off. I grew up in the Northeast as well. So I definitely uh-huh. had ticks in my life too. So it's really gross when you catch them in there. They've just lodged themselves from an animal or yourself and they're just bloated, filled with blood, right? It's, yeah, no. And they're, they're yeah, you're like, this was on my body. So, yeah, I've had them in my head too as a child. So I sympathize. I'm like, you were in Pennsylvania. I was in the Virginia area. But oh, okay. Sure. We all still get those ticks and we got to be careful because at the end of the day, you're right. Things like Lyme disease, that's tough. Well, and you know, there is an art to taking the tick off. There's certain things you do and don't do. And then nowadays, they didn't have this when we were kids, but you can send the tick off to labs to be tested. So you know if like your kid needs to be treated, if you need to be treated, oh, if your wow. dog needs to be treated. And it can prevent somebody from having years and years of chronic pain. There's a lab that's called Pennsylvania Tick Lab. It's free for anybody who lives in Pennsylvania. And then if you live in another state, I think it's like $50. I'm not sure. I'd have to check the price. But you mail the tick off to them. If they just test for Lyme, which is Borrelia only, it's a certain price. And then if you want co-infection testing, because there's other infections that ticks can carry, not just Lyme. So Lyme, by definition, is only Borrelia burgdorferi, whereas there's other co-infections like Babesia, Bartonella. You can have Pawasan virus. There's all sorts of other things. And so some ticks will carry multiple infections. Some will just carry one. So I actually had three infections simultaneously, some chronic viral stuff, and then a lot of GI parasites. So I essentially had a petting zoo at one point. Wow. Um, (laughs) You were hosting a lot of guests, unwanted guests. I had chronic pain for years. I would get fatigue that would hit me. And the main sign that you have Lyme is muscle pain that comes and goes. So like one week, your back will go into spasm and then it gets better. And then the next week, all of a sudden your knee swells up to the size of your head and then it's better. And then you get the ankle pain and you get like just systemic joint stuff. And the reason why is the Lyme bug will actually create an enzyme called collagenase that breaks down your collagen. So that's part of the patho mechanism of how- Nobody wants that. We're trying to get more collagen. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. (laughs) So the migratory joint pain is patho mnemonic of Lyme. And then chronic fatigue that doesn't get better with rest. Often people have neurocognitive symptoms. They have brain fog or they're just not mentally clear. And what's I feel like you described so many people. Right. (laughs) I was like, she described Lisa, me, my neighbor- No, No, I'm joking. I I feel like that's a big diagnosis, right? That's a lot of people. And when you said joint pain that migrates, I was actually wondering, is there any sort of connection to Lyme disease and gout or is that way off? So gout is elevation of uric acid and the uric acid forms crystals in the joint. I have never seen a connection between gout and Lyme. I have seen a connection between gout and elevated heavy metals, particularly lead. And we had one client, oh, this poor guy, he was young. He was in his like early thirties and he was coming in with horrendous joint pain and we tested him for heavy metals and he was off the chart in lead. And you can go to like PubMed, like NIH and type Uh in gout and lead and like tons of stuff show up and it's legit. It's just not part of mainstream medicine. But this poor guy, he was taking turmeric that wasn't tested for heavy metal toxicity. And that what will happen is the turmeric will clean the heavy metals out of the soil. And so you really have to be careful with supplements that you get. Oh, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So he actually gave himself and he had the genetic predisposition for gout. Now, so I've never seen gout associated with Lyme, but I have seen pseudo gout associated with Lyme. And pseudo gout is an autoimmune disease where you get a different type of crystal, not uric acid crystal that develops in the joints. And it's often misdiagnosed as gout, Mm. but the crystals like refract in a different direction than the gout crystals when you look at them under a microscope. Okay, Ron, no more questions. We want to hear Emily's story. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) Oh, I I love the tangents. No, I'm all good. (laughs) But anyway, I had chronic pain uh, for years. I suspect I had autoimmune disease for years. When I was in medical school, I was really having trouble functioning. I was having debilitating headaches, migraines. I would always get worse with menstrual cycle, which is also a sign of Lyme. You know, I went to the school, provided us all the students with a doctor, and they're like, oh, you're just stressed out. 
you need this antidepressant, you're just depressed because you're in med school and all you do is study and take care of sick people. And, you know, this person was my mentor. I believed them. So, you know, I took the antidepressant unnecessarily and somehow I made it through school, but I was brewing autoimmune disease for years. So since you were little, all the way up until you graduated med school. Okay. And then when I was in residency, I developed a bad gastrointestinal bleed and I was diagnosed with Crohn's. They offered me some medications, but I didn't want to take them because the medications, one of the side effects was that it could cause cancer. So, okay, that's a side effect. All right. right. And I've actually had cancer three times. So thank God I never took it Oh, because I might not have survived. I've had breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and I also had thyroid cancer. Whoa. Yeah. Oh so my. before I went to med school, I used to do cleanup of nuclear waste sites and I worked with uranium on a regular basis. I was getting my PhD in this thing called microbial bioremediation, where we use microbes to clean up toxic waste sites. So I did have a huge toxic exposure, which is part of also why I'm very interested in environmental medicine and how we can get sick from this type of stuff. But when I got diagnosed with Crohn's, I started going to acupuncture just out of desperation. And it helped me more than anything I learned in like conventional medical school. And then at the same time, I was working in the ICU and I was seeing just these terrible end stage cases. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen like family drama in the ICU. It can be really intense because, oh yeah, you know, Mm -hmm. yeah, really intense. And one day I signed seven death certificates and I was like, I can't do this. This is not what I went to school to do. And I felt like there was a lot of burnout, compassion fatigue in all the healthcare providers. And then, you know, I would ask compassion fatigue that we have two really good friends that are doctors. And yeah, I would say he's probably going through that for sure. And it's even worse now after COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you can't we're not designed to be around that sadness and give, give, give like that, like 24 seven, right? Yeah. It's like still you be compassionate afterwards, right? And still connect. Do you disconnect yourself to protect yourself? And how can you connect to the individuals? That's tough. That's a real tough. Yeah. Time. Shout out to doctors. Right. For that. So all this was going on in the perfect storm. And so it inspired me to just like quit. And I went back to school for acupuncture at that point. And for years, I didn't want to be associated with doctors. I just wanted to do acupuncture. And I helped a lot of people. I treated a lot of pain. But at the same time, I got sicker and sicker and sicker and nothing seemed to be working. For years, like Chinese medicine kind of like maintained me, but it never Mm -hmm. hurt me. And then my husband and I, about 2015, started getting interested in functional medicine. So together we did the IFM certification, the Institute of Functional Medicine. And we were at a yoga retreat at Kripalu up in Massachusetts. And my husband picked up this book called Why Can't I Get Better? And it was a book written by Richard Horowitz, who's one of our mentors about Lyme and chronic disease. And I read the book and I was like, oh my gosh, this describes everything I've been going through like for years. I did Lyme testing with like a boutique lab because the conventional tests miss 50% of cases. Part of the reason why is they're focused on antibody testing. And one of the things Lyme does is it destroys your immune system so that you can't mount an antibody response properly. It's, so it's the ultimate stealth pathogen because wow. it's, it'll wow. literally evade your immune system. What? Like a parasite. Yeah, exactly. Like a parasite. You kind of mentioned this earlier, Emily, but can you share with our listeners the all the eight signs that your aches and pains may be due to Lyme disease and other tick-borne infections? Sure. I, we mentioned a few. But what are the eight? First of all, the classic constellation of symptoms is fatigue, pain, insomnia, and cognitive issues. Number two, the symptoms will come and go. You have good days and bad days. And it depends on what actual infection you have. So some of them have like 23-day life cycles. Some of them have 35-day life cycles. So, you know, you'll have like a couple of really bad days because the peak of the Lyme is or whatever other co-infection is at a peak. So, and number three is what we said before, the pain that migrates around the body. So we call that migratory joint pain. And that's a classic symptom for Lyme. In women, symptoms tend to get worse right before and like first couple days of the menstrual cycle because estrogen tends to aggravate Lyme symptoms. So some of these other people might feel way worse if they try to do birth control pills or if they get diagnosed with 
needing extra estrogen at menopause. So that's number four. Uh, five, often people will get a bad worsening of symptoms if they take antibiotics. So let's say you have a sinus infection and you take antibiotics. Well, those antibiotics are going to start killing the Lyme. And then the Lyme will die literally in your bloodstream and release these endotoxins. And when the endotoxins get released into the bloodstream, it just triggers havoc. And they, they actually have a medical term for that. It's called a jarish herxheimer reaction. We call it a Herx for short. And then there is a color- Which would normally be a kind of sound like a detox symptom, right? Like a parasite sure. die-off. Yeah, it's right? a die-off of the bacteria, basically. It's a okay. bacteria die-off. So it sounds like it's doing its job to help with the Lyme, but it's not, right? It's not like a- There's an art to it because the problem with Lyme, and I mentioned this briefly, that it's a stealth pathogen. So the Lyme actually is a shapeshifter. So you have like a cystic form a form that lives in biofilms, another form that is in the bloodstream. So when you treat with antibiotics, often you have to use more than one to address the different forms that the Lyme takes. Wow. And, and I mean, if you think about it, you got to respect this microorganism at a very deep level because, you know, it can live in a tick, it can live in a human, it can live in a dog, it can live on a deer, it can live in a raccoon. I mean, mm. so... It yeah. has this ability, it senses its environment and will turn on different genes depending on its habitat. Holy, oh, it is a shapeshifter. Wow. So you said Lyme is only from one particular Right, tick. technically Lyme is Borrelia. Borrelia. Yeah, and then there is another one called Bartonella, which is associated with pretty significant neuropathy, especially of the feet. And it will also colonize the uroepithelium of the bladder, the inner lining of the bladder. And so what can happen with that is you can get this chronic burning urination and you think you have a UTI, but you don't. It's just, Whoa. yeah, and people are miserable. It's called interstitial cystitis, but a lot of times we test and they actually have Bartonella. And then there's another co-infection called Babesia that's associated with significant night sweats. And also people will experience these episodes of shortness of breath. And then one of the key things is um, Lyme is the only known disease that causes what's called migratory nerve pain. So I'm not talking joint pain, I'm talking neuropathy. So you'll have neuropathy in your feet one day, and then the neuropathy goes away, and then you have neuropathy in your hand. And neuropathy is like a tingling sensation, correct? It can be tingling, it can be burning, it can be, sometimes it's painful. When I had neuropathy, it felt like when I would walk on the floor, it felt like somebody had sandpaper on the bottom of my feet. And I mean, it wasn't like that terrible. It was more annoying. I had other symptoms that were worse. And so it is important if you do suspect you have Lyme, there's a quiz you can take that's called the MSIDS, which stands for Multiple Systemic Infectious Disease Syndrome. And I can send you a link to the PDF. So oh, okay. perfect. Yeah, my Put mentor... Richard Horowitz created it and oh, wow. he did testing to validate the quiz. And it's basically you check off your symptoms and you list the severity. And if you score a 46 or higher, you have like an 85% chance of having Lyme. Wow. That's great for people to get started. Cause like we said, a lot of the symptoms that you. Yeah, it's, it's hard. And like, you know, and some people of course are under reporters. Some people are over reported. I'm a very sensitive person and I tend to like overreact to the world. So when I took the quiz, I was like 120, but I'm kind <laughs> of intense, you know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but I also had all three types. I had Babesia, Bartonella and Borrelia. Good. Okay. So are these ticks in every region of the country? Good question. So that's a great thing. And one thing you could do is you can go to that Pennsylvania tick lab and they actually have a map. And you can click on your state and it'll say, oh, 53% of the ticks from Florida had Lyme. And it's fascinating because I've diagnosed Lyme here in Miami. I had a little girl, she got bit by a tick right here in Miami. And people are like, oh, there's no Lyme in Florida. There is. And then there's other companies that are fancier, like Igenix does tick testing. There, there's a bunch of labs that do tick testing. labs? Yeah. So, but they can be... So depending where you live, you might have one type of tick, but maybe not all three. Okay. So right. You could... And so like Colorado has another type of co-infection called like Ehrlichian anaplasma. Those tend to be on the West Coast 
or like rickettsia. You might have heard of that one, which is also called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever that you can get from. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So is there a state that's immune to ticks? Antarctica, probably. Ooh, I, they don't have yeah, I don't know. I that's they don't a, have that's an interesting <laughs> thought. <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of like the snakes in Ireland, right? That's an interesting question. <laughs> What's up with that? <laughs> so it's not really true that most of the tick infection happens in the Northeast or a general... So there is a higher like concentration of Lyme there. Okay. But, you know, there's airplanes. And, you know, one of the things that is not talked about enough but, you know, we have destruction of our habitats and ecology. And as you get less woods and less places for things to live, humans are now the new reservoir. And so there's all these shifting patterns. And this is where you get into true public health, because the health of the wildlife around you affects like the health of your children and your family and yourself. People don't think that out of sight, out of mind. You know, it's sad. I know I pains me when I see developments going in and then taking down wetlands or whatever it may be. It, it just crushes me because it's all about more housing, more housing, more housing, and it's or more, you know, retail centers and things like that. And not no regard. And then people are like, a bear was in their backyard. And I'm thinking, where do you think the bear was going to go? You just took away his habitat. Yeah, there was that a bear at Walt here. Disney World like last I month. Yeah, I know. Yes. And I was like, poor bear, it was hungry. Yeah, they need their food and we're taking away all that with the deforestation and all of that. So yeah, and a whole nother show, by the way. But <laughs> okay, so <laughs> we need you back. So anyone could get bit by a tick. You don't necessarily know that you've been bit by a tick, correct? Because yeah. you were bit. Because the ticks release a thing in their saliva so that you don't feel them. So that they you can, don't feel yeah, them. so that they can, yeah, they have and like an anal analgesic. And then the other thing is Bartonella can be transmitted by fleas or oh, sand flies. Geez. I know. <gasps> I mean, we had pets, we had flea infestations. Right. Oh, you know, so I'm a clean no person, but that. it can happen. Cause yeah, you know, it can it's, happen. Yeah, yeah. South Florida, you take your dog to the wrong park. And, right. And, what does the tick need to survive? Could it survive in a hotel worm say, or ooh, it obviously needs the I'd host. have to look that up honestly. Cause I don't know like how many hours between when it's on you or a bird or whatnot. Right. Yeah. I, I'd right. have to Emily, actually research that. Probably not hotels. We would hear more. That's bed bugs. Oh, That's a whole right. other yes. show we need to do. Um, <laughs> For sure. Not Emily, so is it common to have all three types? So some people do, or, or some people will have only anaplasma, which is, you know, ones that's more common on West Coast. There's a viral infection called Pawasan virus. One of my sickest patients had Pawasan virus that can be transmitted by ticks. Yeah, that's crazy. It's crazy. I'm just like in shock. I really didn't know a lot. Now, is this true? Was there a period not too long ago where the medical industry was denying Lyme disease as being like an actual thing? So they still don't accept the idea that there's chronic Lyme. If you talk to like conventionally trained doctors or if you go by the CDC or like the basic infectious disease doctors, they think that if you have Lyme, you just take doxycycline for 10 days and you're fine. Yeah. Okay. And I not, that. you know, when I was in medical school, we did have like mentioning of Lyme and it was basically like, we had like a quizzes on, you know, we had tests like every other day and it was like, oh, a patient was hiking in North Carolina. She came home with a bullseye rash. What do you do? And a lot of people never get the bullseye rash. So the bullseye rash happens like the tick will bite. And then you get this rash in rings around it as the bacteria starts spreading. But a lot of people never have, but the rash depends on immune reactivity. And there is genetics behind who gets long chronic Lyme and who doesn't. So, so some people will get this huge fever, body ache, sweat, like horrible flu-like symptoms. And then other people like never mount this giant immune response. So they don't really think they're sick. And those are the ones that often end up with chronic Lyme. And so one thing that can happen when you're walking around with a chronic infection with for years, especially something like Bartonella. So Bartonella is what's called an obligate intracellular bacteria. So what that means is it has to live inside your cells. So if you have a chronic infection inside your cells, guess what happens? Your immune system starts attacking your own cells and it can be a driving factor in autoimmune disease. And so I've had multiple clients, you clear these infections and all of a sudden their autoimmune disease goes into remission. Wow. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. It always traces back to something like that. So did you say people could be genetically disposed to? Yeah, there's predisposition, just like, you know, everything. That someone could get bit by the tick and be totally fine and someone else yeah. would have the chronic Lyme. And I also think there's certain people who are just better hosts for this kind of stuff. I have a genetic immune deficiency that's rare called a, a CD19 deficiency that was only like discovered and characterized in scientific papers like after I was out of medical school. So I didn't even know about it. And it was like, I diagnosed myself about two years ago, but I was like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. Why I've, I've had so many infections and, and whatnot, but not all my clients have that, you know? Um, so one of the things I do look at when we newly diagnose somebody in our clinic is we always do a deep dive into what their immune function is. So we look at these things like IgG subclass one, two, and three, and B cells, T cells, and like a full immune panel to see how it's functioning. And this is where things like environmental toxins, like mold toxicity comes in because mold will impair your immune system. And so then the Lyme has a party. So like I got super sick when I was going through uh, cancer treatment because I already had the immune deficiency. And then I was even more immune depleted from the cancer and I was sick. So I was staying home in a mold toxic home, which I didn't realize. Oh, geez. You had mold too. Oh I my mold God. Too, which is how we got into this. So then the chronic Lyme had a party and just everything broke loose. But I mean, it's great because now I can help a bunch of other people. So it's good. Our pain becomes our path, right? Our pain is our path. So I know I have so many questions. I will want to give a little shout out to Our friends, Trista, the first bachelorette, I'm sure a lot of people listening remember her and her husband, Ryan, firefighter. They're actually friends of ours and he got Lyme. He's a firefighter. I don't really know the story of where he got it or where he, I mean, they're in Colorado when he hikes and he's very outdoorsy, but he ended up having a lot of roadblocks to his healing until he found bee venom. And I think people did a whole cover story on him on how this bee venom I believe has cured them. I don't know. That's the so interesting. So I've never done bee venom, but I did do other things. I had a client who had uh, Parkinson type symptoms and she went down to a clinic in Mexico and she was injected with bee venom in multiple acupuncture points. And she came back with like 75% less symptoms. Now she's still like technically has Parkinson's, but it's at a place where she's not debilitated. So it was amazing, very right? interesting. I don't, yeah, I don't know enough about it. Yeah, That's something that, super there's a company. Though. And if, if I think of it, I will, that he worked with, uh-huh. I forget the name of it. And if I come across it, I'll, I'll email it to you. So I did, one of the things that helped me the most, and usually I don't bring this up on podcasts, but you guys, if you bring up bee venom, I actually did medical leeches and it I helped me that. a bunch. Oh. So I was actually at a Lyme conference and they were talking about how Lyme can cause hypercoagulability. And what that's just the medical term for like, you know, tendency to have a blood clot. Of course, like I was super hypercoagulable with like elevated fibrinogen. And I also have genetics called Leiden factor five, where you're more likely to have a blood clot. You know, they were talking about like all these medications you can use. And I was like, oh, the side effects of these meds are terrible. So I like just started literally Googling you know, natural anticoagulant. And I knew about a bunch of Chinese herbs that we use all the time in Chinese medicine. But one thing that came up as is medical leeches and medical leeches are super interesting. So they release a natural analgesia in their saliva, which helps with pain. They release stuff that's like a natural blood thinner. And then they have a natural antibacterial stuff in their saliva. And so I didn't go to the Everglades and like get my own leeches. We ordered them from a lab in Colorado and I applied them. And I was having like a migraine that was like eight out of 10. And within 10 minutes of my husband putting the leech on my leg, my migraine went down from like an eight out of 10 to like a two. Whoa. It was such an interesting, like truly symbiotic relationship because you end up sharing a blood supply with this creature. Wow. So, there's so what is it? Leeches suck your blood? What yeah, do they, they do? suck your blood. And then what? when they're full, they just fall off by themselves. Oh, so they're pulling out like impurities, mm-hmm. I guess. That's the concept. And you know, if you look at like old textbooks from like, even just like 200 years ago, they were commonly used in Europe. They were used in Egypt. They were used in ancient Greece. They were used in Rome. They were used in Chinese medicine. Yeah. 
we're here in Orange County, California. And if you've heard of the OC Housewives, Real Housewives of Orange County, the one, her name is Heather and her husband is the plastic surgeon. And they wrote a book about all the, I don't know, medical doctor and Mrs. Something. And they did all these experimental treatments and they wrote a book about it. Oh, interesting. I would love reading it. Yeah. One of the episodes, they go up to a party and she has a leech. This is so gross, but she has it on her stomach and it's sucking from her, her belly button. No, I did oh. this like at home in my bedroom. Like, no, no, I was it's like, not a yeah, yeah. that we offer at our clinic, just so you know, because it's pretty out there. It did help me a lot with chronic pain, though. Does the leech die afterwards or do you use it again? So you can use it again. Now, another person cannot use it because that's your leech because you could possibly transmit, you know, the Lyme or whatever. Oh, right. But you could put it on your leg and then does it hurt when it bites? So you know what it felt like getting a paper cut with like somebody squeezing lemon juice on it. Oh, mm, Oh. okay, like a sting. Yeah, but it wasn't like terrible. But like, honestly, after about five minutes, it went away and then it healed. Now, some people have like allergic reactions to it. And I was fine with the first few. Honestly, I did it for a couple months and it helped a lot. And it helped the antibiotics work along with the Chinese herbs I was on. So I do see it as a factor and why I got better because I have other people who've done antibiotics and even like, you know, the correct regimens and didn't get well. So I think those little leeches, but I started developing allergic reactions. So just like you can be an allergic to a bee, you can be allergic to a leech. And so then I had to stop doing it because one time my leg swelled up and I needed prednisone. And I was like, oh, that's oh, the last thing I need to do. Could have been something in the leech, right? I mean, the leech. No, because it was the same leeches. So. Oh, it was what? It was the same leech. Oh, the same. (laughs) You named him. He was your pet. But when the leech is done, (laughs) when it's all done with the one patient, do you let it go in the wild or you can't do that? So I did. I I don't think they can live anywhere, can they? I let them go in the Miami River. Now, some of them would just like I had special jars and I would change the salt, stuff like that. Whoa, this is so interesting. But they can't live anywhere, right? They live in water. Do they They live in in water? water? They live in swamps. Oh, so Florida could have leeches? Oh, yeah. If you go to the Everlight Glades, you can get bet by a leech accidentally oh, in the swamp. Okay. I but I wouldn't that. do a swamp one because who knows what's in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Great point. Great oh, my point. God. Talk about going down tangents. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is so interesting. Okay. Emily, can you explain the importance of an integrated approach to patient care? Obviously, we've been talking about that <laughs> in yeah. like a lot of ways. I mean, I think it's so important on so many levels. My patients who do the best do multiple modalities. They're doing vitamin IVs, they're eating clean diets, and that'll depend on the person, what kind of diet they need to eat, what activity they're doing, they're addressing the psychosocial, spiritual aspect of whatever chronic pain or illness they're dealing with. You know, if this is something that could just be solved with a pill, they wouldn't be in my clinic. Yeah, um, there wouldn't be any illness. Yeah. In the world. One of the big problems that I see, and a lot of people go to these centers that say they're holistic, but like the acupuncturist is down the hall and then the doctor's over here and none of them understand what the other person's doing. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And so it's very different if you have somebody who's actually trained in multiple modalities. Now it is a lot of extra school and it also requires the ability to hold multiple paradigms in your mind simultaneously. So I'm looking at some people come in and they have these very strange occurrences. And I'm like, oh, maybe there's something astrological or karmic going on with this. So I'll look at medical astrology for some things. I definitely believe in labs and concrete reality and testing. Mm-hmm. The other thing that so I we're all in, because you're a shaman or you're trained in shamanism. Yeah. So we are all energy. Definitely. Yeah. We don't a lot of times in healthcare even approach that. That's not even discussed, right? Like the energetic or the spiritual aspect. Yeah. That's a good point. Bringing that into the concrete labs and then combining it with these other things. I know we've interviewed so many people who have said the same thing, you know, that a cancer or a major illness stems from an emotional trauma. Almost always, for sure. Yeah. And then, you know, the other thing I do see, and maybe you're aware of this already, but I know you understand parasites. There's a type of parasite called toxoplasmosis that can be carried in cats. 
and cats can transmit it through the cat litter, which is why like a pregnant lady is not supposed to change the cat litter box. Right. Because, oh, that's oh. where that's uh -huh, that's okay. where it comes from. But what's fascinating is they've done studies of rats and rats will normally avoid cat urine because they're like, oh, there's a cat. I'm going to die if I go near a place where a cat's urinating. But if the rat gets infected with toxoplasmosis, its behavior changes because the toxoplasmosis actually changes the behavior in the brain and the rat gets attracted to cat urine so that the toxoplasmosis can go on to the next stage of the life cycle. And this is actually documented in science. So oh, interesting. parasites can actually affect your behavior. And I'll see have patients who come in and they're very sick with multiple chronic infections. And I don't see a big difference between toxoplasmosis and Lyme or a chronic viral thing. And I think part of it is the parasite changing behavior. And you almost have to do an energetic cord cutting yeah. in order to be able to have successful treatment so that the patient can actually be compliant with what they need to do to eradicate it. Right. They have to allow that. They've done studies of people who are infected with toxoplasmosis and they have increased risk taking behavior. So more like uh, speeding with car accidents, more wow risk taking behavior and even just like financial risk taking. It's fascinating. Take a look at some of the science studies of toxoplasmosis. That's and risk. crazy. It's fascinating. But I think it just goes back to the energetics of these microorganisms that we're in relationship with, whether we are aware of it or not, you know, it's a dynamic relationship. Right. So is that parasite in the cat urine then? It's not fecal matter. It's actually in fecal matter. Oh, fecal matter. Okay. But like the smell, the behavior of the rat is what, oh, is is what they the documented. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you have to touch it to, to get it or can you yeah, actually you inhale it, it? Can you breathe it in? So yeah. you can breathe it in. Oh, oh geez. I know. my goodness. Okay, everyone who has a cat That's listening, a we're sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you need to get the fancy, fancy cat litter thing. Yes, that exactly. Itself. What's exactly. that thing called? <laughs> no, because, wow. you know, it's... Spend the money. It's worth it. Yeah. <laughs> Spend the money. And I it. mean, all this stuff is treatable, but, you know, there's a lot of people who adopt a rescue and might not do the testing and stuff like that. And there is a thing called... I don't think anyone does. Yeah. Who's doing the testing? There's a syndrome in pregnancy that's called torch syndrome. And it's basically infections that can cause fetal anomalies. And so T stands for toxoplasmosis. O is other. R is rubella. D O R C is... Ooh, I want to say it's chlamydia and H is like herpes, but it's like an active herpes infection. So if somebody has an active herpes infection, they'll often give like, you know, antivirals or do a C-section. But anyway, these kind of things wow. can affect fetal development. And that's been known for years. My husband's an OBGYN. But this, oh, is, this is all like okay. basic stuff. Your dinner learning. conversation's got to be <laughs> <Right>. so interesting. <laughs> for sure. You, you are so multifaceted. There's, You're there's like, so I'm not going to eat that. And like, well, <laughs> <laughs> we'll just eat we met tonight. dissecting a cadaver. Yeah, and you guys you would really? love it. Yeah, we really did. What? 23 oh, wow. years ago. Oh, gosh. Wow. What did you say? Uh, we met dissecting a cadaver 23 years ago. <laughs> Wow. That's so romantic. It was the <laughs> last, and it, you know, it was the last place I thought I'd meet everybody. I, I'm sure. I was in these gross <laughs> scrubs. My hair was pulled back. The smell of formaldehyde. I mean. Wow. Oh that is God. a unique story. Like I mentioned before, you're so multifaceted and there's so many directions where this conversation can go, but I wanted to ask you a couple of questions sure. in this area too. So Chinese medicine. So what are the five elements of traditional Chinese medicine? I love this question because I work with this all the time. So you basically like picture a little circle and right here you would have wood. So imagine like a tree growing up and you take wood and you can burn it and you can turn it into fire, right? And then fire turns into ashes. So you get earth, you dig in the earth and you get metal. And wherever you have metal, if you have a piece of metal out, you get condensation. Water just magically appears. So then you have water and then you water plants and you get wood. And so the idea is that these are energetic forces of creation. And we all have all five. The idea is it's like a carousel. So you want balance. If you imagine, if you go to like a merry-go-round and the one horse is way bigger than the other and you have a tiny pony here, then when it spins, it's going to go like... Wah, 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 wah. But you want like an even spin. So the idea is to be balanced and to have all five elements present. And then in Chinese medicine... 
really what you're talking about is forces of energetic creation. And one force will feed another and generate another, but then there's also this dynamic interrelationship between forces. So for example, metal cuts wood, or you put out fire with water. And so there's balance within the body. And they equate all of the organs with a specific element in Chinese medicine. And so like your idea is to balance everything and even be personality types. And you can assess that through like the face. You know, if I wanted to do facial diagnostics on you, Lisa, you have like gorgeous cheekbones and cheekbones are considered fires, a lot of fun. They're very creative. They're good oh, communicators. That's totally me. Oh, However, wow. the problem with fire is you can burn out. So you that's got me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's all me. You hit, how did you know that? That's incredible. Uh, it's, wow. Unless I love fire. Like Ron knows, I always have to have a fireplace on and candles lit and like. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, fire is the creative force. It's like, it's really the artist and whatnot. And fire is a lot of fun, but like I said, it can burn out. And so all of these things, you can have good qualities and others that can be more problematic. Ron, you have like a combination of water and wood. Open foreheads, is this is signs of like a broad thinker. But wood, wood needs a goal. Wood likes to have things to accomplish. Oh, that's me. And it gets very frustrated if it can't meet its goal. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And then the quality of the chin and the softness here, that's actually water. And water is the wisdom of everything. So, you know, you're probably quite the philosopher at a certain level. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I accept that, Dr. Emily. Yeah. So I said, Emily. That's really cool. Can someone do a Zoom consultation and have you read their face? Sure. Yeah. So okay. I feel so blessed. I've had so many amazing mentors. The woman who taught me Chinese medical facial diagnostics, she died about two years ago. Oh, yeah. Two years ago in September. And her name was Lillian Bridges. She learned from her grandmother. And it had been passed down in her family. And she had two sons that she loved and they're great people, but neither one of them were interested in learning the Chinese medical facial diagnostics. And so she opened a school and taught people because she didn't want the knowledge to die out. And it's funny, she was half Chinese and half German and grew up in California. And she was gorgeous. She was a model. And her grandfather in Hong Kong was a super successful banker. And he did facial diagnostics to know who to like lend money to and who not to. Really? Oh, use how it that funny. Deep? <laughs> yeah. You could use well, it in I'm business sure. and everything. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I only use it in like diagnostics and how I approach different people. Yeah. Oh, oh my God. You got to listen to our podcast episode. It was 86, 87, somewhere in there. And it's a numerologist that we had on. Oh, interesting. Oh, he does house numbers specifically, his name's Jesse Kelsey and comes from India and has this very specific, he's patented even, not patented, but trademarked his kind of technique. He views every number as a planet. Well, it is, it corresponds with a certain planet. There's also crystals that correspond and then the colors. Oh, okay. That's so cool. I love that. I got his books. I'm like, one of the audio books I have is seven hours long. So it's really intricate. You're taking your birth date, uh -huh. your birth name, your home address, and making sure that those energies are cohesive. Because if you have, say, a number on your birth date that is clashing planetary-wise with your home, certain things could happen depending on the planets. Okay, so like the one is the sun and eight is Saturn. And those two planets very much collide. Oh, yeah. And Saturn is always associated with chronic health issues. Oh, okay. Yeah, it gets into all of that. And there's fixes. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, he created something called number patching, where you can make changes. You can even change the spelling of your name. You can do number patching on your house. And he has fixes. All these stories. He works with politicians and celebrities and how they've changed their health, their relationships, their success, and all of that, just incorporating that. So then you're talking about like the facial, there's just so much more that we don't really know, right? Yeah, no, for sure. And then part of how I use facial diagnostics is I don't even really do formal consultation. I mean, I do, but like, it's not really how I use it, but mostly it's how I approach people. And I'll be like, oh, this person's super woody. They're going to love blood ozonation. 
or which is like a super metallic treatment and metal is like the balancer for wood. And so it's really helpful in choosing what's going to help the person based on their actual constitution. So it's because I've heard of the tongue Mm -hmm. in Chinese medicine where they'll read the tongue, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. And the tongue reflects the different energetic organs as well. Can you look at someone's tongue and go, oh, I know they're having kidney issues or liver. Yeah, but it's hard to see (laughs) via Zoom. I have to see them in person. Yeah. (laughs) No. Yeah. And, you know, of course, this would be like Chinese medical kidneys, which is more like adrenal exhaustion type of thing or, you know, lower back pain. I always have that conversation that the Chinese medical energetics is like when I say, oh, somebody has like liver cheese stagnation, that doesn't mean they have cirrhosis. You know, it's just uh, liver energy. energy. Is- so you could tell that from the time. Yeah, for maybe. sure. Like the energy, sure. like something's on imbalance. And then, you know, they, you will get certain suspicions of like what labs to order based on what you see. And I mean, if somebody really has bad mold colonization of like the nasopharynx, and GI tract, you will see that reflected in the tongue as well. Oh, what does that look like? Black. Like thrush, like like okay. a really thick white. Oh, okay. Coating, yeah. You know? but- and I mean, that's even accepted in conventional medicine. Wow. I have a question. I read a book by Dr. Holda Clark. I don't know if you're familiar with her. She did The Cure for All Illnesses and then The Cure for All Cancers. And she was very out there with her modalities and frequency devices before anybody was really doing this. And she thinks that all disease is caused by parasites and toxins. Do you agree with that? You stumped Emily. I see. Stump her. (laughs) I'm really trying to think. Here's what I see a lot. I see a lot of issues with lifestyle, whether it's like poor sleep habits, poor diet, affecting stuff. I also see internal pathogenic factors, meaning stuck emotions. And I also think there is such a thing as ancestral bloodline stuff. I also think there's certain things that are literally karmic from previous lives, whereas like the bloodline is more past in the blood, like who your parents were in this lifetime, whereas others is like previous time experiences. I definitely agree that there are a lot of literally like parasites and whether that's a virus, a bacteria, a fungus, or an actual like amoeba or worm. I mean, all of that is an issue. And elevated toxic burden is one of the biggest issues I see in all Americans. Whether it's like, you know, plastic in your yoga pants, that's being absorbed Blue, through the skin. Yeah, exactly. Lemon, yeah. Or toxins injected in your face or pesticides in the food, or I love to go golfing. So you're exposed to atrazine and atrazine turns male frogs into females. And, you know, like all that stuff is, is re- a mold toxin in your house. Even if you're a clean person, you can have water damage in the walls that you can't see and you're breathing in spores. You're speaking our language. Heavy metal toxicity. I mean, I really thought about it. I don't think it's just toxin and parasite. I do think there's those other factors, lifestyle, emotions. I got to look at the book. I think it might have been a third thing, but I think when she says life or toxins, I think she meant like, yeah, toxins from your food, toxins from your water. Yeah. Not just, yeah, lifestyle would be a part of that and what you're ingesting. But you're right. The ancestral aspect. Is oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, but That's I mean, where the shamanism but, comes in. Yeah. yeah. And what a, what a powerful opportunity to try and heal your ancestors, you know? For sure. And I want to be cognizant of time here too. One quick question here. So how is Chinese medicine and acupuncture used for pain management? Because we get a lot of people asking about acupuncture. Oh, so I wrote a chapter in Neil Nathan's book called Energy Diagnosis. I think it's Energetic Diagnosis. You guys would love this book because you're into this. So Neil Nathan, he was my mentor for mold toxicity. He was a family doctor who trained in pain management, and then he got in the world of Lyme and then later mold. He had a clinic for years in Santa Rosa, and he had me write the chapter on acupuncture in his book. And the way acupuncture works is that energy meridians run in fascia. And fascia is super interesting because it has what's called a piezoelectric effect. And here's where you get into your crystals. So piezoelectric effect is present in crystals. It's also present in your fascia because your fascia is essentially made of collagen and collagen is a crystal. 
And what that means is that when you press on something with mechanical force, you release a flow of electrons. And they've actually done studies in Germany where they inject acupuncture points with like nuclear dyes. And so you can see the nuclear medicine travel down the channel. So like five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, two hours. And so the channels do have an anatomical basis in the fascia. And I think a ton of people have pain because their fascia is adhesed. Interesting. Adhesed. What would cause your fascia to get adhesed? Chronic inflammation. And I don't mean to get gross, but you know, like if you make a piece of chicken and it has... Well, no, we're vegan. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, we used to a long time ago. To, okay. So imagine back in the day when you used to make chicken, you'd have like a piece of chicken breast, right? And then there's the skin and between the skin, there's that stuff that holds the skin together. And that's collagen. That's also fascia. That's like the chicken's fascia. And fascia is what holds us together. It's around all our muscles. It's like what makes up our blood vessels. Like your aorta is basically made of collagen and stuff like that. And it can transmit like electrons and it can also transmit biophotons. It's pretty magical. Wow. So like getting acupuncture just to keep the chi, Mm -hmm. the energy, the life energy force moving is good. Would you say even if you don't have an ailment? Oh, for sure. I think everybody needs acupuncture once a month if you're human. And especially in the living in the world we live in today. And then, you know, part of what they're now suspecting as people understand plasma and the four state of matter, like the Chinese character for chi, if you actually look at it, it's a kernel of rice with the cloud on top. And so what it stands for is a change in state. So you take something like rice, which is concrete reality, and you're sublimating it, literally like a chemical composition change from solid to gaseous. You know, usually it goes solid liquid gas, but with the character for chi, you're going from like literally from solid to gaseous. So it's about changing states. And I really suspect that what she is is actually energetic plasma, which is your fourth state of matter. She is. Okay. Wow. This is so interesting. Okay. Right. I mean, I know I'm going <laughs> to. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm getting off track. I know. So, I'm like, I could go down tangents. Okay. Okay. And we're going back to Lyme. Uh-huh. What advice for the diagnosis and treatment of Lyme would you say? So, and other stealth infections, if someone has other stealth infections and Lyme. Yeah. If, if you're concerned you have a stealth infection, Take the MSIDS quiz by Richard Horowitz. You okay. can just. Take- and by stealth, when you use the word stealth infection, are you talking about Lyme? Yeah, I'm talking about Lyme, but I'm also talking about like, oh, you have chronic H. pylori. Oh, you have cryptosporidium. You have, which is like a, an amoeba, you know, or like, oh, you have chronic Epstein Barr virus. I consider all that stealth infection because you look at the person and they don't look sick, they look fine. Oh, okay. Or their labs are coming back up because you hear this all the time. Right. Well, if you go to a regular doctor and they run a CBC and CMP and they're like, everything's fine, but you're like, but I'm dying. All the time. We hear this all the time. So many people, and that's the most frustrating situation for people to be in when they feel terrible, but the doctor is telling them everything's fine. It sounds good, but it's not because they still don't feel good and they don't have answers. Right. And that's really common. Right. Okay. One more question. We said one more question a few questions ago. All right. What are some practical tips on how people listening can start regaining control of their health right away? Wait, I don't think she answered my question. No. What advice do you give to these people if they have the self? Oh, so I would recommend first taking the MSIDS. And if you score at the end of the quiz, they give you the results. And then if you score high, find somebody who's trained by ILADS, which is the International Lyme and Associated disease syndrome society, and then get yourself a real test so you can figure out what's going on. And, you know, I have people who, you know, mostly treat with herbs. I have other people who treat with blood ozonation and IVs and other people who need antibiotics. That's the kind of thing you custom tailor depending on the person, their constitution, what treatments they tolerate, what's best for them. So so that's really further down. But the first step is just to actually get a proper diagnosis. And unfortunately, the tests are often not cheap. I was just going to say, be prepared to open your wallet. But, you know, as they say, pay the farmer now or pay the doctor later. Like, just know that if it might seem like a lot up front, 
it's going to be way more if you don't address it. It's oh, going to be sure. way more long term, right? So be prepared to invest that money into your health and find out, get to the root of yeah. what's going on. I'll do a follow up email. We can give you like PDF of that people oh, can that access, great. and then ILAD so they can access that if Perfect. they're interested. Okay. Um, and I'll of course, practitioners vary. Like you know, might be the wrong person for you, but right for your friends. So you know, that's the kind of thing you have to figure out the right person to help you. And insurance, does insurance, if like the doctor suspects or proves that you have Lyme, will insurance cover all this kind of stuff or? It depends on the person's insurance and, you know, what state they're in and all sorts of stuff like that. I mean, insurance often covers antibiotics, but not like the boutique Lyme testing. And it really depends. Okay. Gotcha. And you would say if someone has that, would you say it's okay to take antibiotics? I mean, I know I try to avoid it, but I do find with some cases, it really is necessary and it can be life-changing. I, are antibiotics overprescribed? Definitely. Should be, they be in our food system? Absolutely not. However, if you have like, you know, a really bad infection, I think it can be really life yeah, can be beneficial. Okay, yeah. good. So I think there's a place for it, honestly. Right. And this yeah. is where I am much more conventional than other practitioners who, who don't use antibiotics, but I think there's a place for it all, honestly. Well, you're bringing it together. That's you. <laughs> yeah, all right. Great job. And you had another question, Rod? I did. I jumped. Wait, I got to clap because I'm looking at Rod. Like, <laughs> ask your last question. Okay. Okay. Emily, what are some practical tips on how people listening can start regaining control of their health right away? If you're chronically exhausted with brain fog and nothing is working, you can have your home tested for mold. It's a Swiffer test. You basically buy a Swiffer and you can do it yourself. You collect the dust and they look for the spores in your home. But I think it's one of the biggest environmental toxins and one of the biggest health problems that we don't realize is going on. And even if you're a clean person, you can have mold toxicity in your home. And that can be done I like the do it yourself test because like you can call somebody and hire them to come out and it's a thousand dollars and they might miss it. Uh, the crappiest way to test for mold is air trapping and people come in, they're like, oh, I air trap my house. It's fine. I'm like, eh. to go do the switch, go do the called the Ermi and hurts me test. Honestly. Yeah, that's a good one. In fact, our podcast that launched today is on mold. Remediation. Oh, OK. Yeah. You'll okay. love it. It's really gets nitty gritty. Well, we've done a lot on mold, but this one, he's a remediator. And so kind of got more in, in well, Florida. Well, that's good which... because like, I'm a healthcare practitioner. I'm a doctor. I don't know about fixing people's houses. And people ask me these contracting questions. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> right. And exactly. You can't know everything. No, Nobody can. absolutely yeah. not. I know how to treat the mold in your body with binders and anti- fungal herbs and, you know, pharmaceuticals, but I absolutely don't know how to fix your house. So right, you're a wealth right. of information and they expected you to know everything <laughs> because. <laughs> well, that's why, you, you know, you, you all make a good team. And so people can, listeners who are in this boat and want to get help, can they, you'll do Zoom consultations. I know you're a non-insurance. Yeah, it's limited what I can do if you're far away. And I'm always very straightforward about that. We do have a waiting list for new clients, but I will try my best to help everybody. Okay. So they could start with the mm -hmm. consult. And even if but okay, like, you know, if I think you need like weekly vitamin IVs and you live in Oregon and I'm in Miami, it's like really limited how much I can help you. Yeah. Um, but maybe at least to order the test to get started. Oh, for sure. Or them. like help you okay. find a practitioner, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Right. But I'm always like very straightforward because. Or, you know, I do a lot of injections with peptides for pain into acupuncture points, you know, mm. that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. I can't do that if you're like in Canada and right. I'm in But Miami. people could travel too. They could come. To sure. If they have the means and ability. And some people have the money, but not the time or, you know, family obligations. So that kind of stuff happened. Okay. Well, this has been amazing, Emily. We could talk to you for five more hours. Um, <laughs> so we'll have to have you back. But thank you so much. Guys, you can learn more about Emily's services at miamibeachcwc.com. And you'll find all of the links in the show notes at ronandlisa.com forward slash podcast. Be sure to subscribe to this show, rate and review it so we can continue to bring you fabulous interviews to up-level your health. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye, Thanks, Emily. Emily. Bye. 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 
This episode of the Healthy Home Hacks podcast has ended, but be sure to subscribe for more healthy living strategies and tactics to help you create the healthy home you've always dreamed of. And don't forget to rate and review so we can continue to bring you the best content. See you on the next episode.